Shalom. We are honored to have uh, with us today Professor Kevin Murphy. Professor Murphy is considered the leading expert in executive compensation in the United States, perhaps in the whole world. He also more than 40 academic articles on executive compensation and consulted many leading firms and the government on CEO pay and incentives. Kevin, welcome to Israel. Thank you. I would like to interview Bu Yu on behalf of the National Directors Association and ask you some, first a general question. What is the problem of CEO compensation in the United States? Are CEOs paid too much? I appreciate if you provide a brief answer. Uh, I'll, I'll do as, as, as quickly as I can because of course the are CEOs paid too much is a, is a fairly uh, complex question. It uh, depends, are they paid too much uh, from whose perspective? Uh, one definition of are they paid too much is are they paid in uh, a competitive market for managerial talent, sort of the meeting of supply and demand. Uh, we seem to have in the U.S. Uh, a more and more active market for CEO talent. More CEOs are being hired from the outside in arm's length transactions and the prices keep going up. Uh, there's little to, to suggest that uh, at least by that metric, they're not paid. That they're paid too much. I, I think uh, many of the people will say they're paid too much because the market is somehow corrupt, or the market, or the CEOs are setting their own salary. Uh, the, I think the evidence for that is at least nuanced, if not uh, fairly hard to come by. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, there's a large bid-ask spread for CEOs. In other words, the maximum amount the company would be willing to pay is a lot higher than the minimum amount that the CEO would be willing to work for. And I think that uh, CEOs have been, or managers that uh, might become CEOs, have been pretty good at bargaining higher in that bid-ask spread and, and getting, they're, they've gotten pretty good at bargaining. What do you say about the regulations and regulators all over the world, they keep uh, piling up various restriction directives on CEO pay. Are those really helpful? And I think, you know, my answer is absolutely not. I think they've been a nuisance and they've made pay uh, higher and less efficient uh, in every country that I know of. I, I think there's a couple simple rules. Do you, do you mean that without government and uh, regularity authorities that the, what the CEO pay would be lower, would be simpler? What, how, what do you think it would be? It, 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 without question it would be simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'm basing most of my thoughts on the U.S. experience mm -hmm. and what I know about other countries, but not necessarily the, the Israeli experience. Well, the world follows the United States. Hey, but but uh, <coughs> the, look, uh, there, there's a place for government regulation, as we know. It, it, it might serve to mitigate market imperfections, but they haven't really been clear in saying what the market imperfection it is they're trying to, to mitigate. Uh, we know that there should be laws and rules that are enforced that protect property rights. We know that CEOs shouldn't steal, they shouldn't embezzle. I could probably go down half the Ten Commandments and say, you know, those are things that CEOs uh, shouldn't do. And there should be laws and rules that protect shareholders from them doing those. But whenever the regulations are trying to socially engineer uh, executive compensation, which they do, uh, the the, uh, the the result is almost uniformly inefficient and expensive. Can you give us an example of how government regulation basically counter fires or uh, about unintended consequences yeah. of, of government regulation? Uh, it's in the U.S. There have been a couple categories. One I would say would be knee-jerk reactions to isolated events that then are imposed on, on, on all companies. So we could give lots of examples from Dodd-Frank, uh, 
uh, or, or any time in, in the past. Uh, but I, I think a good example would be in the 1980s, uh, in the midst of our market for corporate control, there was one executive who received what was considered to be an excessive golden parachute payment. It was $4 million. Uh, and Congress quickly passed a rule that imposed severe tax penalties on golden parachute payments that were above three times what they're called their base compensation is. What happened because of that? Uh, number one, every firm adopted a golden parachute. It used to be only a handful of firms had them, but all of a sudden the government was saying, oh yeah, you can have them as long as they, they pay me less than three times mm -hmm. base compensation. So that happened. Number two, golden parachutes are contracts that provide payments when a, an executive is terminated following a change of control. Uh, those were severely penal penalized. Companies figured out that a way they could circumvent this regulation is by offering contracts that provide benefits upon termination regardless of whether there's a change in control. So we saw this explosion in employment agreements, very expensive for shareholders. Uh, number three, it led to what was called an excise tax gross up. In other words, because the tax authorities were putting this tax penalty on the executive if their golden parachute was too high, the, and we often wouldn't even know they that. It up. The, the, the companies grossed it up, and then they started grossing up all kinds of other benefits that, uh, that were formerly mm -hmm. non-taxable. Uh, this rule also made it advantageous for executives to exercise options early. Uh, for for the peculiar reason that says, I said that the golden parachute was limited to three times base amount. Whatever that base amount was, it included the amount you gained from exercising options over the past five years. Mm -hmm. So if you exercised options, you'd have a higher base amount than if you didn't exercise options. That generated bad behavior, okay. all because we were upset at one executive who got a four million dollar payment. Uh -huh. A few questions about Israel, with your permission. Listen, recently, a new law forced each publicly traded company in Israel to publish its executive compensation policy. The regulator even required each company to put a cap on bonuses and to limit discretionary bonuses. That because of it, uh, what do you think about such a regulation? Okay, so, so two parts of the regulation. Uh, on the first one, the, the company should publish their executive compensation policy. The good news in that regulation is at least it forces companies to have an executive compensation policy. Uh, so regardless of the fact whether it's disclosed or not, uh, I think there's too few compensation committees that, that really sit down and think about, well, what is our compensation philosophy? What is our comp compensation policy? And it's a very good thing for them to have. Uh, it has to receive a shareholder approval in a general meeting. Yeah, and that, that's, uh, the, the, and the, the only problem with, with bringing it up, publicly disclosing it, isn't to shy away from shareholder approval, is that of course it opens up the policy to ridicule or, or criticism from parties that have nothing to do with shareholders. Mm -hmm. From the media, from the government, from the labor unions, from other, I will call them, uninvited guests to the bargaining table. But I don't have, in terms of all the different regulations of pay, I would think a, a, a regulation that requires disclosure and approval of a general policy is um, one of the more innocuous and, and potentially uh, beneficial policies. Mm -hmm. Now, on your second part, when you say that uh, regulators have also discouraged any kind of subjective or discretionary pay, uh, I think that's a uh, major mistake. It's one that we followed in the U.S., but it, it, it's a major mistake there too. It, it's uh, We know there's no perfect objective measure of performance, and we know that there's lots of reasons why the board should always retain 
some part of compensation to pay on a discretionary basis. So for example, if they can tell the, the executives are increasing the county performance by doing something that, de that decreases long run value, or if they want to reward a CEO for actions such as succession planning that might not show up in current accounting returns or current stock returns, or if they've uh, discover something that won't show up for several years in, in accounting returns or, or stock returns. The uh, board should always have the ability to make those kind of uh, adjustments. The, the reason why the regulators in the United States, going back to 1993 and now in Israel, have uh, come out against subjectivity and discretion is because they don't trust the directors and they're convinced that if you give the directors a chance to make discretionary either payments or even withdrawals, a lower pay. Uh, if you make pay, part of pay discretionary, they'll use that discretion to overpay CEOs. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a symptom of a government not trusting directors to do their jobs. <laughs> you are telling me. Um, so, what is your advice to company directors or compensation committee? What should they focus on when they determine the, the CEO pays or top executives pay? I think they should focus on the alignment of interest between shareholders and executives. Uh, they should focus on providing incentives to increase the long run value of the firm. They should recognize that the long run value of the firm is not shareholder value because a firm is, is worth more than just the price of its shares. And they should also recognize that... What, what do you mean by that? Well, well, we have other claim holders. Let me uh, put, uh, note in particular the debt holders mm -hmm. and, and all the financial claimants of the firm. Mm -hmm. And the, the, we want to maximize the value of all the financial claimants. Now, as long as executives can maximize the value of the shares without taking anything away from the other fixed claimants, the debt holders, and the, uh, for example, then that will maximize the value of the entire pie, but we, we don't want to be in situations where executives increase the value of the shares by essentially stealing from the other, yeah. the other stakeholder groups. That, that's, that's what I mean, but we also have to recognize that even the value of the shares is not the current stock price. The, uh, we know that executives will just naturally, inevitably, have information that would be relevant to valuing the firm that's not incorporated into the current stock price. And so it's always a mistake to reward executives for short-term gains in the current stock price. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of mistakes that directors uh make or typically make while contracting with CEOs? Uh, I think most of the mistakes comes in terms of the bargaining power that we talked about. It is that compensation committee members are not trained in negotiation and, and the situation, at least in the United States, is very often the compensation committee is negotiating with not the CEO, but the lawyer for the CEO or an agent for the CEO who's trained in negotiation. That compensation committee has usually already decided this is the person we, that we want. It may even announce that this is the person that we want, and now they're negotiating over the price, and it gives the agent for the CEO almost all the bargaining power. The, the, uh, the directors are not paying with their own money, and they feel that the cost of hiring the wrong CEO is so much greater than the cost of paying the, the person they want a little too much, uh, that it's a recipe for, for overpaying. And, and what happens even more often is the directors get out of the room and let the general counsel or the head of human resource bargain with the agent for the CEO. And, and these are individuals, individuals who will be working for that CEO in a couple weeks, and of course, that's a recipe for, for over overpaying as well. Mm -hmm. um, a, a big question, how should executives be incentivized? What, what works best as incentives? 
I, I think a gold. We have seen the, the transfer from options. Once everybody used to give options, now everybody gives stocks. Can you can you tell us a little bit about the differences between the two incentives? What works best? So when we think of the compensation contract and where do the incentives come from, we have. We, we have incentives from the usually accounting based bonus plan. It could be short run, it could be longer run, based on longer run accounting performance. We have uh, equity plans such as uh, stock options, restricted shares, or performance shares, which are restricted shares that only vest if some performance criteria are met. Uh, and uh, we use these plans when we say incentivize, that's also a loaded worm. We're, we use these plans to help attract the right type of executives. So for example, through self-selection to get executives who think they can move the company forward. Uh, we use these plans for retention incentives. And a lot of the vesting requirements that, that we see on these plans uh, aren't necessarily to provide stronger incentives to work hard, but they're to make sure you stay in the firm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you don't quit. And of course, we provide, we try to provide incentives to create long, long run value for the firm. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you made me pick one, uh, I would pick equity plans. If you made, if you push me even more on that, I think a gold standard for a lot of us would be have the executive return salary and get instead stock, pure stock without performance hurdles, but have to have the executive pay for it. I think it's important for the executive to have skin in the game. And so when we, when we talk about the optimal form of incentives, it matters a lot whether you're talking about incentives that we're just going to give the executive on top of what he already makes, or incentives that we're going to charge him for by reducing other kinds of compensation. Mm -hmm. So the devil is also in the details, often in the details. I think stock options have been shown to be a pretty effective way of giving incentives when we're not willing to reduce other forms of pay very much. Because you can get a lot of incentives without it costing shareholders too much. Uh, just giving them stock seems very expensive because there can be a, a big payoff even if the value of the shares go down. Mm -hmm. but, but see the difference if we charge the CEO for, those, for, that, for that stock. Mm -hmm. uh, then that, that creates a, a highly linear incentive everywhere. Uh, actually, this is another point I want to make, which is uh, performance measurement is only part of the story. Uh, a, a more equally important part of the story is how is the relation between pay and performance. It's not just how you're measuring performance, it's uh, whether the relation between pay, per, pay and performance is essentially linear, where we put caps in it, where we put thresholds, where we put floors. Uh, all sorts of things can, can have a, a terrible effect on CEO incentives. They can, uh, even if you have the perfect performance measure, if you don't relate it to pay in the right way. Uh, is something else that companies will do is, is they'll set targets for incentive plans based on meeting budget or how you did last year, uh, which, which can also be disasters in compensation plans, even if you've got the performance measure right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you say about banks? You know, there's recent regulation of bank uh, CEOs following the big crisis, and there is some kind of uh, cap on variable payments and incentive payments for bank CEOs, what would you, a Bank of Israel recently adopted those caps, suggested in Europe, what would you say could be the effect of something like that? I, I think that the, uh, the regulation of bonuses and the cap to, let's say in the Europe case, but you see this is what's been adopted in Israel, of a variable pay equal to no more than fixed pay, maybe double fixed pay with, with enough shareholder votes, is a, is a disaster. It, it's, it, it's a case study in unintended consequences. So let's just, off my head, let me just start talk, talk about some of them. We know base salaries will go up. 
uh, we know base salaries will go up because that's the only way that they can uh, e even maintain the less competent managers. We know if base salaries go up, we, we know that uh, the banks will become less competitive. We know that they'll be less uh, able to wither business cycles. We know the banks will be more likely to fail. Uh, we, we know that uh, the, the managerial talent will uh, be less likely to go into banking. Now, there's, there, there will be some people who say that's a good thing. We'd rather these people became doctors or uh, teachers and not and not bankers. But I think a lot of that reflects uh, ignorance about what bankers actually create. The banking is not a zero sum game or a negative sum game. It's actually uh, been a very positive sum game. Uh, and, and financial innovations that have gotten a bad name over the financial crisis have actually lowered the cost of capital for people buying homes, for people, for people investing. It, it's been a good thing, and we can thank our banking sector for it. Okay. Well, we thank you, Kevin, for sharing with us your uh, interesting perspective. Uh, we wish you a pleasant stay and perhaps a spiritually rewarding stay in our holiday.